and welcome to episode two of season four of the Dead Parent Club podcast. We're very excited to be here today and we have a wonderful guest. So we'll be talking to trauma-informed grief and loss therapist, podcast host, writer and TEDx speaker, many accolades there for you, Megan Reardon Jarvis. Um, she'll be showing her own experiences of grief and loss and her key learnings from, learnings from over 20 years of experience in the fields of trauma, grief and loss. So Hopefully, I mean, Emma and I will have a whirlwind of questions. Oh, we are going to be in our absolute <laughs> element with this one, I think. So welcome along, buckle on up for the Dead Parent Club podcast. And hello, Megan. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me, ladies. It is a real honor to be on your podcast, which I love. Honestly, we thank are you. so excited to have you with us. Um, for anybody that doesn't know about you already, can you just tell us who you are and give us your backstory, please? Sure. Sure. Yeah. So uh, Megan, Reardon Jarvis. I'm a trauma-informed therapist, like you read. Um, I'm in Washington, D.C., where I've been for, you know, a couple of decades. I've got three kids, an English husband. He's from Guilford, <laughs> Arsenal Represent. <supporter. laughs> um, yeah, yeah, we, we like Arsenal in this household. And yeah, so I have been working as a trauma-informed therapist, which I would argue really is working with people who are, are navigating loss, tremendous loss, profound loss, overwhelming loss, and helping them through body-centered modalities. So things like sensory motor psychotherapy and IFS. And so rather than tell me how you're feeling, more modalities that are, you know, where do you feel that energy inside your body? So I've been doing that for two decades wow. and probably became a therapist and probably became a trauma therapist because I, my family suffered at the town that I lived in. We lost a teenager when I was nine. He drowned while my family was on the beach. You know, many is small town. So many wow. people. And, and it's sort of like the formative event of my childhood. And as I, as I grew up feeling very other and odd, I didn't really come to learn or understand until I was in therapy that that other and odd is sort of the hallmark of children with unresolved childhood trauma. Mm. And so when I discovered that, it was just like the most fascinating thing. And I really wanted to help other people with that. And I did that for a long time. So for about 20 years, I, I went back to school. I got a degree. I have a degree in developmental education and then a social work degree, which over here is like a psychology degree for you guys. And um, trained in all the things and worked with lots and lots of people in D.C. We have, you know, a lot of folks in the government and in um, defense services. So I had plenty of clients. Mm -hmm. And then in 2017, my dad was, well, in 2016, he was diagnosed with small cell cancer, which is essentially a terminal illness. And it took him about a year, which is what doctors typically project to die. He died mm -hmm. from his cancer. And during that year, I really participated in his death. I spent a lot of time with him. We didn't have the easiest relationship. I have five brothers and sisters. He was in varying levels of closeness, you know, with different siblings. But he and I had never been that close. But the year that he died was just an easy, like, I just want to sit with him and let him feel loved by me. So it was a very simple task. Mm. And um, and when he did die, it was very sad and it was hard, but I wasn't traumatized by it. I, I um, knew it was coming and I participated. And then two years later, my mother, who I was much closer to, um, died suddenly while I was on vacation in her house with my family, my dog, mm. my husband, um, and that was the opposite experience. That was profoundly traumatic. I started to develop PTSD symbols, um, symptoms pretty much immediately. Um, and that really, it was sort of like an embodied experience of what I had been helping people with mm. for a really long time. So I always describe it. It's like I went to France after being a travel agent to people mm. who were going to France for a mm. long time. And suddenly I was like, oh, my God, this is what the bread tastes like. Um, so my P PTSD symptoms were pretty immediate and they were it really intense. They showed up as images of my mother's body because I prayed over her after she died. And so I couldn't get the picture of her dead body out of my head mm -hmm. every time I closed my eyes. And then eventually when I didn't close my eyes and I also had a thought, which was that it was my fault that she died. And, you know, I teach people about ruminations, which are those loops that your mind goes into. 
I actually know what they're for. They kind of distract you from the intensity of the loss. Like, how mm. am I going to live without my mom? So I had all this metacognition of like knowing what was happening and still not, you know, knowing something doesn't that stop you. That must have you. been surreal. It really was. It really was tremendously mm -hmm. um, surreal. And the thing when people often ask me, like, was there anything that was helpful about all of the stuff that you knew, all the books that you had read? And what was helpful was that I knew I needed more support than I had. Mm -hmm. So I, ch I, I knew 100% that as my symptoms were getting worse and not better, that it, that was only going to continue. And that even with my intense amount of resources, I checked myself into an inpatient facility, which is the one where that I had used for many of my clients. So the surrealness of sitting in a chair, you know, I was checking myself in and this woman who I'd spoken to on the phone many times in relation to clients was like, so we have a lot of um, names that are associated with your name. Do you want us to send your clinical file to them? And I'm like, do I want you to let my patients know that I'm in this? <laughs> I sure don't. I mean, ultimately, it's something I talk about with a lot of pride. It's actually the thing I'm the most proud of mm -hmm. in my life is, is my choice to go to, um, to intensive treatment because I really do think it... I don't know if it saved my life, but I don't know where I would be if I had let the the sort of hill that I was careening down if I hadn't gotten myself out of it. So after that, I came out and started writing books and talking to people and, you know, just using my voice in a very different way. So I still see clients, but not that many. Most of what I do now is talk to companies about grief and loss in their spaces. Mm -hmm. And I churches and large organizations more really trying. I mean, you know, my big goal is to just shift the conversation and the culture around grief and loss so that we're better educated and we're less awkward. I think it's brilliant that you were so um, educated, equipped and self-aware enough to check yourself in for that help, Megan. Mm -hmm. And I think that what struck me when you were talking is that somebody who can sit with people day in, day out and you know, can almost offer them a rational voice against what so often is an irrational voice. And I blamed myself for my mum's death as well for a period of time. Um, it fascinates me. And, and what I want to know is when you did check yourself in, was that, I don't really want to use the word irrational, but was that a rational voice louder than the rational voice for you? Oh my God, I love that question. No one's ever asked me that. <laughs> um I think it's like, I think it's like maybe how some people ha begin to have suicidal ideation mm. when, you know, like you, be you can become helpless and hopeless in your grief because it is so overwhelming to your central nervous system. You know, our brain is essentially a tool for prediction. And so it takes your past experiences and sort of puts those screens up. So that you'll be, you know, I know what this ice coffee is going to taste like because I've tasted ice coffee before. And I talk about this pretty often. I was in London, actually, when I was in college and a friend took me to my very first Thai restaurant. And I remember the very first time I tasted lemongrass and it was unlike any other flavor I had ever tasted. And so that was like a truly novel experience. And our brains actually don't want novelty because energetically it's expensive. It's like hard to embrace novelty. It would rather be able to call up past experiences. But the problem with grief is I had never, not for one second of my entire life, lived in a world where my mother didn't exist mm. anymore. Mm -hmm. And it was completely overwhelming. It was like the center tentpole fell down. And what happened for me, because I'm very somatic, and by that, for your listeners, what I mean is my emotions show up in my body. So I'm the kind of person who like gets hives, my lower back goes out. I had this insane thing where I was trying to exercise because exercise is so important when you're, when you're in trauma symptoms. So I was swimming. I was outside swimming in this beautiful pool. And I did that for three days and suddenly I couldn't get the water out of my ear. And I went to a, a walk-in clinic. I mean, I barely had enough energy to like be upstanding. And I went to this walk-in clinic and they referred me to a specialist that I went to right away. And it turns out in the, the course of the three days of my swimming and maybe beforehand, but I'd had recently had an ear, ear exam. So no one had caught it if it was there. These tiny little bones 
had started to grow across my ear, like stalagmites and stalactites, like up and down. And they were growing at such a rate that they were going to touch and close wow. and completely occlude. It's called, it's actually really common for, for the water in Australia is really cold and the surfers, the 18 year old surfers get this. It's mm. called surfer's ear. And so here my body suddenly was like, you're going to keep trying to do things, mm. but it's, we're trying to tell you that is not enough and it's not going to work. Mm. So my ears did this and then I threw my back out and I literally couldn't get off the floor. I was down in my basement on the floor and I couldn't move. We called the EMTs. I couldn't let them touch me. And I turned to my husband and was like, we need more help. Mm. So I, so I don't know exactly how to describe it, except that it was hopeful and helpless and hopeless all at the same time. Mm. Like I had the hope of knowing the phone number and the names of the people who have been like Superman rescuers to my clients in their time of hope. And what I can tell you is Dick Schwartz in IFS therapy uses this phrase called hope merchant, which sounds a little bit like you're selling hope. And I think maybe I'm more like a hope mule. Like I have just seen people bear the most unbearable things. Mm -hmm. You know, like car accidents where all their children die or, you know, watching their watching their entire family be swept out into an ocean during a tsunami. Like I have had the honor of working with people who shouldn't have survived the amount of loss that they experienced. Mm -hmm. So I think the checking myself in was both a I know I can't do this for myself and I know I need to be hopeful that I don't that this can be managed and born and lived through. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, I was absolutely terrified. The day that I stepped like in front of the actual door, I was shaking like there was going to be a lot. I mean, I didn't stop shaking for like two days. Mm -hmm. Just the idea that I was so not myself and so um, unable to be the version of myself that I had been when my mother was alive would scared the crap out of me honestly. Was it quite hard as well? Was there, did you feel like there was a certain expectation of you to be able to have dealt with what happened easily? You know, I think, I think I got a degree in all the hardest kinds of therapies as a, as a way of trying to circumnavigate needing them. I didn't know that at the time, but I think I thought I was, I, it was like a, you know, a bomb shelter. Like mm -hmm. I'll, I'll never need any of this food <laughs> in these tin cans, but I'm going to make sure they're here. I don't actually think, you know, I have a supervision group. I was just with them, two women that I've collected as uh, clinicians who are dear friends. And they were instrumental in helping me see how sick I was in saying like, you have to take this time off. You can't go back to work. Um, because you know, I was still buttoning my sweater. Like I was still taking a shower. Mm -hmm. I wasn't eating or sleeping, but people couldn't see that. Not yet anyway. Um, I don't think people thought I should keep it together. I had a really hard time being around people who knew me before my mom died, because mm -hmm. I was like, I, I felt like I had been torn into a thousand pieces of energy that were like in a swirl. So I had a really hard time sitting in front of people and them acting like they knew me mm -hmm. when I didn't even have any idea who I was. So, so I was very isolated because I found people terrifying. Mm. I, I felt that when I remember um, Megan, when my mum died and I'd only just turned 18 and Almost selfishly, one of the first thoughts I had was, I don't want to be the girl with the dead mum. I need to make sure everyone knows I'm okay. And all of a sudden, my lifelong friends, I felt I was hiding a part of myself mm. and spending my days exerting so much energy just trying to prove to the world I was okay, while simultaneously hating myself, thinking no one really knows who I am underneath here. And this energy bubbled away underneath me because I couldn't ever fully navigate a day being myself mm. and which is why I'm so interested in what you do because 
however you grieve, there is no way that it can't come out in you physically. Yeah, totally. I mean, we grieve with our bodies, right? Mm, I mean, that's what we grieve with. That's our mind and our bodies. And so, but listen, you know, 18, like what is harder than just being 18, Mm -hmm. right? Like you are trying, when you think developmentally of what it means to be 18, like Mm. you're both trying to become your own independent person and also just exactly identically like everyone else Mm. who is on social media that looks like they're having a good life. Mm. It is so hard. I think one of the things I think is important to talk about in grief is where are you developmentally? Yeah. Like when you were just talking, I was like, Jesus, you know, everyone I know is a therapist. I've been talking about grief and loss and reading about grief and loss and connected to people who study grief and loss for 20 years. And I could barely bear my mother dying, Mm -hmm. like the gentlest death ever. She died in her sleep. It wasn't like she was hit by a car in front of me. Like she was a little old lady who was ill, went to sleep and didn't wake up. And I couldn't bear it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I literally couldn't bear it. So, you know, I do think when I came out of treatment, one of the things that I felt very um, like beholden to was this idea that we do not educate people about the physicality of grief and loss, right? Like, and I say this a lot, you've probably heard me say it before, but I have three kids, all three of those kids, they're 15, 13, and 11, all three of them have taken human health classes that prepare before they go through puberty that is like, Mm -hmm. listen, your voice is going to drop, your boobs are going to come in, there's going to be hair in weird places, so that those kids don't become either afraid or self-loathing, right? Like you're not doing anything wrong because these things are happening. This is a natural course of your body. Well, it turns out, you know, and because I'm trained in trauma and trauma being all the things that can come into the system that that leave a permanent imprint that is worse than, I'm trained in trauma and in trauma, we do a better job of sort of saying like, look, this landed in your five senses. Like when you were in that car accident, you saw things, you heard things, you smelled mm-hmm. things, you tasted things, you touched things, and they're inside your system. So it's not just this moment in time that you went through and survived. That moment left splinters inside you. Mm-hmm. Grief, the the profound loss of something, and it doesn't have to be a person. It doesn't have to be your mom. It could be your pet. It could be your job. It could be a relationship. It leaves splinters. And how do we support people both? There's two pieces. One, which is like just telling them what's normal. You know, when you have that thought, like, I don't want to be that girl with the dead mom, that we know a lot about how the brain responds to a trauma. And one of the things that is totally common is it sort of shuts this door and then the energy doesn't go to the right places. And so really inappropriate thinking right at the moment of a trauma is so common. And we don't tell people that. So people will come in after grieving for like a year or two. And they'll say, the first thing I thought after my grandmother died was I wanted a milkshake. <laughs> and they have so much shame yeah. about it. Mm. And I say like, yeah, do you want me to tell you why? You want me to tell you, like, I can show you the traffic pattern here about what happened. It has nothing to do with whether or not you loved your grandmother. Mm. And you can just, like, let go of that shame if you would like to. And there's dozens of things. Brain fog, memory loss. You know, and some of it's really important, like, being able to do multi-stepped things. Like, you know, bring me that piece of paper and then empty out this water cup and then make a phone call. That is really compromised when people have had trauma in their system recently. And that matters. I mean, I worked with a woman who, she was in my writing workshop. Um, She was a nurse. And she was being asked to like do math in her head about administering medicine. And for like 20 patients, she had to remember Mm -hmm. that this one needs something changed. And she ultimately ended up getting fired. And which was horrifying because all she ever wanted to be was a nurse, you know. So there's a lot of it where, like, the basic education really matters. And then 
because we're so not grief informed and we want people to sort of like take your awkward life event that looks <laughs> scary and hard and do that in your therapist's office at lunch on your lunch hour and come back with a smile. We don't make room for what does it mean to, to have these symptoms inside your body? And most importantly, what can we do about those things? Can it, like can how it, can we help? Can I ask you, did you, do you, have you had any recurring health issues since your mum died? Because I have. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, going back way beyond, I won't get into it, but I had quite a traumatic event in my childhood yeah. and yeah. I was hospitalised. I missed so much time at school. I had oh. pneumonia, mm -hmm. whooping cough. At one point they thought I had meningitis and oh I lost God. a heavy amount of weight. Even when I went back to school, I had to leave the class to go and throw my guts up constantly and it massively impacted me. I then yeah. was diagnosed, I had quite a severe uh, mental health condition condition that was not really recognized then mm. all of this stemmed from that period so it had a direct impact on my physical health mm. and um interestingly the only time my physical health improved is when I started getting therapy and that mm. is a fact so I mean, as a result of the therapy, et cetera, I changed the way I lived in terms of my diet mm -hmm. and the things I was putting into my body and the way I was moving my body. But the reason I changed that was because I learned about myself and I was able to express for the first time the innermost parts of myself that I'd, coop that I'd held in for yeah. 15 years and that had 100%. I have a twin brother, uh, Megan, that Kat is very good friends with. And he and I have had this conversation a lot because he has, um, he won't mind me saying yeah. he has colitis. And he yeah. has a similar thing as, as me. He's held in a lot of trauma over the years. Yeah. And we have had numerous discussions about um, the physical impact of the trauma yeah. in our lives. He's now a, a personal trainer and nutritionist because of that, I think, mm, is it? It's because definitely. of that. Did you have any physical? Yes, and my mum died. I was 20. So, yeah, seven years ago. And ever since then, I've had babies. severe IBS and yeah. um, heartburn to the point where I have to take a tablet yeah. every single day because I will just, wow. all the acid from my gut just comes straight up. And I have, I'm under no illusion that that's all triggered. For, it's that brain gut connection yeah. you know that that stress and that trauma has just imprinted itself on you physically on my on my body Megan, can I ask you knowing what you know and being armed with the wealth of knowledge and now experience that you have how do you feel about attitudes towards um you know, grief showing up physically, because in my experience, it there is a, it might not be intended ignorance, but it's almost like people don't want to acknowledge it and mm. don't want to talk about it. If I were to go to a doctor and my physical symptoms had got so bad, for example, they would try and prescribe me something or send me for a scan. But no one ever said to me, um, what trauma have you experienced? What trauma have you been mm. through? Or what's going on in here? How mm. do you feel about the attitude towards that? Well, so I've a thoughts running in a whole bunch of different directions. I, so one is I think it's really important for people to be given to be empowered to understand the difference between traumatic grief and grieving. Mm. And so the field of grief in and of itself gets a little muddled, right? Because people are like, well, you know, I mean, and there are researchers out there that are like, no, nope, most people do fine. Most people are fine. But I'm a trauma therapist. Nobody in my office or anyone who has ever pulled me aside at a cocktail party is fine. <laughs> and when I go to corporations and there's, oh, I always stay after, I always say you should book me over a lunch because someone needs to talk to me. Mm. So, and they don't understand that they need to talk to me. So, so, and I, and I want to go off for a second and tell you a personal story that's still sort of developing that I have that I haven't sp shared or spoken about before. Um, I think there is a need for people to be able to say, I have a history of trauma. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I am more susceptible. I need to be more inquisitive and interested when it comes to a profound loss. 
mm. about how that is showing up in my body and in my mind because it's like I am predisposed to it. When I, um, I had a lot of anxiety as a result of my trauma as a child and when I was pregnant, my therapist at the time was like, I'm just going to do a quick checklist and then we're going to check you for the possibility of postpartum depression. I wasn't even postpartum yet, but I scored really high. And that was helpful to know because then actually I prophylactically took some anti-anxiety medicine the minute my baby was born. And I didn't do it with the second because I didn't have the same therapist. And I was like, oh, crap, I was supposed to take those, that medicine. That's why I'm not sleeping. That's why. So I do think there's plenty of room in the field for people to know, to be invited, even without trauma, into knowing your body more. But I, but I think, so here's the story I want to tell you. Since my dad died, which is almost seven years ago, we're coming up on seven years, I have a lot of trouble eating and I, you know, I'm not thin. I'm not a small person, but when my dad was dying, I, I stopped exercising intently, mm. which is the opposite of what I would tell you as a clinician you should do. But it seemed the most important thing for me to do to sit still. So I was just like trying to trust that. And I was really having a tricky time eating and by that, I mean, I, my stomach, like my ability to actually consume food seemed to, it seemed to be impossible. When my mom died, I basically stopped eating altogether. Wow. And we're three and a half years after my mom died and I'm not a whole lot better. Mm -hmm. wow. And because I'm not thin and I didn't drop a ton of weight, it's not very noticeable. So I've gone to see like world-class specialists world like people whose names you would know i'm on like my seventh well I, I was i stopped a couple of months ago and i'm not angry about this i've been more curious mm. but here's the questions that i get how often do you think about food here's the answer never i never think about food the second question is um how do you feel about your body i feel fine about my body i'm like a plus size person i feel totally fine about it and for many, many months now, I've gotten a, hmm. And then one very well-known person was like, that sounds like denial. Oh. What I have come to understand with the help of mostly myself, I'm not going to lie, is that this is just a window of tolerance thing. In trauma, we talk about neutral being the best, you know, the way that you can sleep well and eat well and navigate and be okay and not be reactive you're inside your window of tolerance people who've had unresolved trauma their window tends to be smaller than other folks and so the window can be you go to anxiety quicker or at a four when other people wouldn't go until an eight or you go into sort of collapse and depression more quickly what I now am beginning to understand is the reason I can't eat is I am blowing outside of my window of tolerance in these mm. small ways, much quicker and without my own acknowledgement. Mm. But, but I just You're like was with at food. capacity, basically. I'm at capacity mm. that, that, you know, because when something really awful happens, there is this whole thing that's actually you know, it's, it, you were wired for this, which is the blood runs to your essential organs and it flows away from your stomach because when a trauma happens, you, you know, your body thinks we're going to have to run. Mm. And so, or we're going to have to freeze or we're going to have to, you know, the fight, flight, freeze response is from the active side of the body. The collapse is from the dorsal vagal part, but it's all, there's all wisdom in it. But it's happening to me over the smallest things. And when you're dysregulated, your job, your whole job, it's like you just cut yourself. Your whole job is to bring yourself back into regulation, regardless of what else is going on. Or you're going to drive your bus into the woods. Mm -hmm. And so I've only just come to this knowing. And, and I will tell you, it's a backwards way of answering the question. I'm freaking furious mm -hmm. that I spent 
thousands of dollars seeking the wisdom of experts and not one person could give me this answer. Mm -hmm. I actually have, I'm now following something on some one person on the internet. It's not that I don't think people know about this, but clearly it is not something that is well known because if it was well known, I would have known about it. All I do Mm -hmm. is read studies and talk Mm -hmm. to people about this kind of stuff. Mm. So that keeps me going, right? Like that keeps me talking on podcasts. It keeps me writing articles. It keeps me having this conversation because if all three of us have physical symptoms inside our body and it took a lot for us to to stitch those things together. Just think about all the other, like non-native speakers who are in Mm. countries where they're, you know, they're small children, people who are in abusive relationships, don't have enough money or resources. Like to me, this should be something that is simply known in the same way that we know that you get cramps when you get your period. Not everybody does, but it's normal. Mm. You don't need to go to the emergency room. There are ways to treat it. And in fact, exercise helps and watching your diet helps. You know, though, and and Advil helps. I I am frustrated that this, but I'm also hopeful because I feel like the field of trauma in the 20 years that I've been in it has been shifting and changing at le- like leaping speeds. The fact that so m- I was over in the UK recently, and right right over in Brookstones, like on the front was Bessel van der Kolk's the the body keeps the score, like the yeah. Bible about trauma. And I was mm-hmm. like, okay. All right, we're, you know, we're doing it. We're, we're trying here. Definitely recommend that. It's amazing. Have you, have I've you got it, it as an audio book, actually. Yeah, it's I brilliant. Listened yet. Um, are there any physical symptoms in particular that you see on repeat, Megan? Yeah. Which ones are those? Yeah. So, so I think about them more as sort of clusters of, of symptoms. Mm-hmm. And, and it's always when I'm with clients, what I say is like the things that screw that get screwed up the most that are, not the simplest to regulate, but it's two things, things that are connected to your hypothalamus and your hippocampus. So the physical symptoms that show up for people are they can't sleep or they want to sleep all the time. Mm-hmm. They are wildly irritable, like irritable, irritable, borderline angry. And that's really hard, particularly for women who have not typically normally felt like they were an angry person they hate that's I mean I said it all the time I hate everyone I know it was like I liked two people and (laughs) and none of them were my children by the way (laughs) um headaches and tension in the jaw and the neck and the back really 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 common digestive issues all of the digestive issues so um not being able to use the bathroom or having to use the bathroom all the time that and and we think <laughs> yep. you know that, right we think that that if you think about how the system works that the serotonin that we need to tell us that we're full and that we're okay and that our body is okay is actually built inside the gut mm. that's where 90% of our serotonin is the other 10% is in the body and so let me just say this cuz i think it's really useful for people to hear so like your brain, when you get terrible news or in a dangerous situation, it has this fight, flight, freeze response, which is on the right side of the brain. That's this active part. The amygdala is at the bottom of your brain and it enlarges and does what I said before, which is sort of cut off some of the electrical currents. So the symptoms that we begin to see showing up, memory loss, poor sleeping, poor eating, low muscle tone, like profound exhaustion, um, big, big pieces of time where you can't place, like you don't know when you went to this place. So sort Mm -hmm. of, you know, not just memory loss, but also confusion about short term static memories, pain in the jaw, pain in the neck, pain in the back, bowel issues, stomach issues. All of that is because of those energetic miscues. The brain has these 12 cranial nerves that send messages down into the body. So you can quickly see, and one of them, the vagus nerve, which is the super highway, but 80% of the messages that come into the brain are sent from the body, up the vagus nerve, into the body, and then these 12 cranial nerves. So it's a little bit, if you can imagine it, like, like you have a sunflower plant and you're pouring diet Pepsi into the into the ground 
at some point that is going to show up. Your le- your little petals are not going to be yellow <laughs> where those seeds are going to begin to fall out. Mm. And that's what begins to happen. And then, you know, and then it rains diapepsy in our little ecosystem. So those are the symptoms that I see the most. People come in and say, I feel crazy. I feel crazy. Like my mailman was trying to talk to me and I was like, get out of my way. I can't stand you. You're such a jerk. Like, why, why was I so angry at the mailman? And what I normally do is I just walk them through. Like, here's what your brain is doing. Here's what your body is doing. Here's why these things are hard. And in a very basic way, remember that we talked about novelty. It's very exhausting Mm -hmm. to do something new. And so people who have children, particularly pre-K, like little kids who go to um, nursery, will remember the first week those little ones went to nursery, they came home and crashed out like they had just run a marathon. They like ate their little, you know, goldfish crackers, drank a cup of milk and fell asleep on the couch like they'd like they been out dancing. <laughs> and it's because everything that was being asked of them to line up, put the toys away, know that the kid who sits next to them, name is Steven. It's so much new information mm. that it fries you. Mm. So people are exhausted, but they're also irritable. That's, that's a typical, that's a typical response. So I just walk people through brain fog is the most common one that I hear from people is like, they used to be poor word recall. They can't like, they, they couldn't remember their uncle's name. And I walk people through and just say, you're doing nothing wrong. This is your brain and your body. It's actually amazing that it's doing this because it thinks something awful happened to you and it did. And then here, you know, the, the probably the most important part is to give a million possible ways to try to get those things back in order. Mm-hmm. And those million possible ways, Megan. Yeah. What are they? Obviously, there are, there'll be loads of ways that you can almost, well, I'd hope there are because I, I have half of those things. Um. But what are they? How can you find some level of calm in your body? Before we go into that question, can I just ask whether, do you you see it from the other side as well, where people struggle with brain fog, et cetera, but the people that actually become a little bit more sort of obsessive with lists and getting things done can't actually just be... Calm. Yeah. Yeah, so if so if you think about I always think about like the the yin and yang symbol, the like we want to be in balance. So when we talk about um Dan Siegel's concept of the window of tolerance, that place where like when we're in the middle of it, we're good. You can be out of your window of tolerance totally a- anxious, like get you can go all type A, like you are the most high functioning. You are a lot mm. of people talk about that in the funeral portion of the grief is like they did all these things and it felt so good and they got it all done. You know, your body may say, let's be anxious. Let's go to defending, functioning, high functioning. Let's think all the time. Or it might go, I I give up, forget it. I'm going to sit in my bed and watch Friends and that's it. The The... The one that's kind of tricky to see is the one that's freeze, which is not actually, it's not depression symptoms. It's more like you can't make a decision and can't move and you can't think and you can't do it. You don't know. That one is a little trickier for people to see. It's not tricky for clinicians to see. It's tricky for people to Mm -hmm. see. But every, every possible response that someone has to their trauma is totally normal and not pathological. What we do when we start to say like, hey, you know, you could go see a grief coach or, hey, you over there who can't stop making lists, who has had the most productive year of your life and not yet, you know, and say, I don't cry, I'm not crying at all or I haven't, I don't think about my mom at all. That person we might send to somebody who is like a trauma informed grief expert Mm -hmm. because in those instances we are probably going to do what we'll talk about is some treatment modalities Mm -hmm. we'll probably actually do some things for the population which i think the percentage that's reported is way higher than reality but that but you know there's a number out there that says like 83 percent of people are fine 
something terrible happens and they spend some time grieving and then like they're fine. I haven't met a single person who would tell you that that is true. <laughs> so even though with even with my dad, you know, it was fine, but it's still hard mm. and it it has been life changing and I did need support. Mm. So I'm not accusing people out there who are like, no, I didn't need any support. I'm not saying you're lying. I'm just saying in my experience, people when you ask them, do they want support? Part of the reason they say they don't need it is because they don't even understand what it would be. Maybe it's not really. And they don't know they're well. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So, so I do think that I do think that when people are overly anxious, part of what we're going to ask them to do is kind of take the. So, in a women's magazine, you might see like, "Are you grieving?" You could take a walk, you could take a bubble bath, you could write in a journal, you could call a friend, you could, as though all of those things are the same. Mm. But what I say to my clients is if you are already in a very relaxed state, like laying in bed for two weeks, taking a bubble bath is not going to help you. Mm. You don't need relaxation. Now, someone who's anxious, we might actually say, what of these 10 relaxation type activities feel possible for you? Could you practice one or two? So that that part of you that thinks it needs to be hustling and on alert just gets like that bus driver gets like a break. Could we practice that? Because truly we actually we're when we're inside our window of tolerance, we're we're pretty neutral. Mm -hmm. And so that person, even though they like it, they're not they're not in the middle. It's really interesting hear you, hearing you say that actually, Megan, because you probably listened to Megan there, Kat, and thought, I know which one of those types mm -hmm. I am. And you're probably the same as me, the high functioning. Mm -hmm. Can't sit still. Mm -hmm. like, are you grieving? Here's a list of 20 things we can challenge to be accomplished today. <laughs> yeah. And then you'll get your serotonin boost. <laughs> it's, the, it's exactly that. I know I'm a high functioning griever and I me struggle too. to, you're the same. Oh, yeah. Like can't struggle to sleep. You know, yeah. even I, I called my friends on Sunday and I was on my way to get a coffee and go to the gym. And it was about half eight in the morning. And every single one of them said the same thing. They were like, why are you up and doing this at this time? And it hadn't even clicked to me that that isn't normal because that's just my life. Because mm. I couldn't physically lay in, lay in bed. bed. My partner goes mad at me for it. I like, <laughs> I'm there at half six in the morning like, yeah, wake yeah. up. <laughs> and and why? Sorry, go on, Megan. Well, but w that's not a problem. So I just want you to know that, like, yes, it's hard and good because I'm sure you guys get a lot of shit done. This, you know, I wrote, <laughs> I've, I've written three books since my mom. Yeah, died. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's so it's not a problem. It's like a space for invitation. It's like an it's like an underdeveloped part of yourself. And so what I what I try how I try to frame it with grievers is like listen because it's almost as though you walked into a restaurant and I was like are you a are you a chef and you said no and I was like well you are now. Come to the back. You need to cook for everyone in this restaurant. It's that it's, grieving is like that. Like you were not a griever at uh, Thursday at two o'clock, but Friday at 10 in the morning, you are. Mm. And so you have to like figure out how to lay the bricks on the path that you are then going to walk. And so every time you look at it and think, or you, you're in it and you feel like, I'm not sure this is right for me or good for me, or I'm watching someone else and they're doing it differently. That's just mm. an invitation to then grow, grow a little bit, like try that on, you know, a lot of what happens for people in trauma, people who've had trauma. So childhood trauma, like you and I were talking about is that we grow up to be people. When someone says, what do you want for dinner? I have a million reasons why I am not going to be able to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know if we're ordering dinner or if you are going to want Chinese food or how much money we have. I'm never able to just like flat out be like Chinese food. <laughs> mm. So when it comes to grieving, there's this concept of like intuitive grieving, which is a pretty sounds pretty similar to the intuitive eating, like these eating specialists that were like, what does your body want to eat? I'm like, if you ask me that again, I'm going to hate you. <laughs> because what I've told you is my body doesn't want to eat anything. Mm. Grieving is the same. I have met some extraordinary intuitive grievers, people who are, they just knew they needed to be out in nature or they knew they needed to move or they knew they needed to write a letter or they knew they needed to go back to their religious practice and so they just like 
followed that and, and they have core reasons why that helped them. Most of the people who come into my office are coming because they have, they have trauma. Mm -hmm. And so what I have for them is an oversized poster board of everything everyone has ever said. Like you're in a diner in New York and it's like you can have eggs any way anyone has ever cooked an egg. I give them everything anyone has ever said helped them through grief. Everything from drinking to promiscuous sex. Those things are on my list to gardening and cooking and singing and getting divorced. I mean, it's all on there. And so I hold it up and I say, just like those quizzes you see on, on Instagram where it's like the first word you see. Is yeah. the word. <laughs> I'm like the first word you see that makes you at all curious. I want you to try that this week. Let's just go in whatever it is. Sex. I was going to say, I promise yeah. you sex, but not because I'd want it just because I'd be like, I want to hear more. Tell me more about that. Um, and obviously, I know people are going to be listening right now, Megan, and they will 100% be thinking, I tick that box or I tick that box. Mm. Yeah. Are there any just sort of basic things that if yeah. somebody is thinking, I can't afford therapy, I don't know what to do or where I'm going, please can you offer us something that might just help on, it might sound generic. Add it to their toolbox. Yes, yeah. exactly yeah. that. So there are some basic things that turn out to be true and they're, I hate how basic they are because it, you know, makes it sound like we just pulled the crib notes Sometimes from like. Sometimes we need to go back to basics. Mary yeah. Claire, but, <laughs> but walking. So it turns mm. out we, we have two different parts of our brain. The right side of the brain is the activation side of the brain. So all your anxiety sort of, con it, it's not as simple as this. So the neuroscientists who are listening are like, that lady doesn't, I'm just, I'm simplifying it. And the left side of the brain is the cooling down and, and the, um, the bringing you back into regulation side. And so anything that you do that has a bilateral movement, it uses both sides of your body in a, re in a repetitious mo motion like walking and swinging your arms or cross boxing across the middle or star jumps swimming or jumping jacks swimming mm -hmm. so any exercise that is going to allow you to sort of move in a rhythm is not i mean look i'm not trying to bash tennis but tennis or baseball or sports like that though you don't get into the rhythm of it we're looking for like a rhythm so swimming is perfect and those those kinds of exercises, you want to keep them at like a four because, and this is tricky, and, and some of your listeners are going to be like, oh my God, my doctor said this to me, I didn't totally understand. If you take the intensity too high, it activates the parts of the brain that think you're being stressed out. Wow. So there are all these people out there who are doing like CrossFit and they're actually not more rested at the end of the day because what they're doing is they're adding stress energetically into the body. I mean, they might be, their muscles might be exhausted, but we're looking for something that is easier than that. Mm -hmm. There's another technique that I really love that people can look up. It's ancient. It's called left nostril breathing and right nostril breathing. So essentially what it is, is you just hold one nostril and breathe so if you are too anxious, you hold your right nostril and breathe only into the left, which is the activation side of the brain. I have a deviated only... septum, so I might struggle with this. <laughs> right. So this one might not work. That's why we have a list on our, but left and right nostril breathing, people can look that up. That is really helpful. A lot of people know box breathing. Um, mm. Box breathing is breathing in for four and out for four which is incredibly regulating. What I think works better is like a five, seven, nine, or a three, five, seven breath. If you exhale longer than you inhale, you activate the calming side of your body. So what you have to figure out first is, are you on the anxious side, you are too activated? Then we do calming techniques. Or are you too low energy, and then we do invenerating mm. techniques. But in general, exercise is really important for keeping your health balanced. 
as is nutrient dense food. Mm -hmm. So for the people who are like, I can't stop drinking milkshakes and I'm eating Doritos and I I actually don't even tell people to stop doing that. What I say is, can you also add something Mm -hmm. that is dark green, even if it's a smoothie? What you can't because see, Megan, is next to me the is diet a, cho- coke and the a diet coke milkshake. and a chocolate milkshake. Yeah. However, I had spinach at lunch, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not. I I'm not here to to you. Just when you think about what is it that your body is trying to do, it's trying mm. to integrate really difficult information. That is a very difficult thing for the the brain to do. You want the 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 gut biome to be as supportive and mm. and generating as much serotonin as possible. And so then the other thing that goes along with that, and you can see this here, um, is just drink a ton of water. So again, when you are learning something new, I do certain kinds of therapies where like I hand people 40 ounces of water when they come in because I'm going to be disruptive with the brain patterns. So, you know, that that actually burns the oxygen and the water that's in your brain. So you just got to drink a lot of water. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those things seem really stupid, but if I, or simple, like if I was going to say, what do you need to do? Commit to waking up in the morning and walking for 30 minutes with no headphones on, no drink 40 ounces of water after that and then decide, do, do I need a comp? Am I feeling too jittery inside my system? And then if that's the case, then go to breath work, find You can, the internet is filled with all kinds of breathing techniques. Go find somebody that you like, do some breath work and maybe some journaling. Mm -hmm. If you find that you are, you have no energy and you're not able to do anything. What I usually suggest to people is that they have three people and one of those people can be your dry cleaner. It doesn't have to be people that you, you, that know you very well, but just three people that you connect to during the day Mm -hmm. by text. Just don't be isolated inside your energy. And if it's possible to connect in person, because those people are going to bring their energy in and your energy is going to react to their energy. Mm. So if possible, it's a tricky one because when people are isolating, other people often feel dangerous to them. Mm. It can activate their system in a, in a pretty jittery way. Amazing. And, you know, I really, I really think it's important for people to know that there are grief informed therapists out there. Mm -hmm. There are trauma therapists and that mostly what our pain wants. This is also true of birth stories. It's true of when you went to college. It's true of your wedding day. People want their stories witnessed. Mm -hmm. They just want to tell them. And then they want someone to nod their head and say, that makes sense to me. Yeah. But you know what? We ask you your birth story and we say, tell me about that graduation party. And they, we watch the video of your wedding, mm. but we get to grief and loss and we're like, Hey, you don't have to talk about it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But don't talk about it. <laughs> Keep that to yourself. Please. So, it's so true. <laughs> it's so true that, and I think, um, hearing you speak, Megan, it's been really reassuring for me. So I think for a lot of our listeners, it'll have been really reassuring because I find myself, and we've had chats about this before, Mm -hmm. guilty of feeling a little bit like the odd one in the room quite Mm -hmm. a lot um, for how I think and how I live and, and how I feel so often. And, you know, sometimes it's just good to have mechanisms to check in with yourself and remind yourself that there are so many people out there who think and feel in their own way that might be different or in a similar way to you and that it is all okay. And somebody like you who has a million different letters, you've done everything. I mean... I have a lot of letters. Yeah, but it's amazing because you speak how I wish the whole world spoke and that is the biggest compliment like I can pay you you um, because I take so much from that. So, and I know so many people will who listen to this. So thank you so much for imparting your knowledge and experience. And I hope that if you are listening to this, you do manage to implement some of those things that Megan was talking about and that they do help you. Yeah, I agree. Um, one of the things we like to, to do on this this podcast, Megan, when we when we finish it, especially if our guests like yourself have also experienced loss, um, is to ask you to share with us your parents' names and yeah. and a snippet of kind of your favorite memory with them. Yeah. So my my dad's name was John, and my mom's name was Mary. Um, and you know. It's funny to sort of like try to pinpoint a particular memory, but when I was in high school, 
my dad invited me on a business trip, myself and my sister, to France. And I think I had never been out of the country. I'm pretty sure I hadn't. And it was a business trip. So most of the trip was like my dad had to be somewhere. We we were traveling around trying to use our grade school French, you know, mm -hmm. while he was somewhere else. And he took a whole day off from his trip and we took a bus tour out to Giverny, which is Monet's home. And it it was exactly what we were just talking about where um, I didn't even really realize he knew how much I was obsessed with <laughs> Impressionist painting. And it's this crazy place, it, you know, just outside of an hour outside of Paris. And I'll just never forget it. It was so surprising. And it was it was such a genuine gift because it was like expensive and hard to get to. And and I remember looking at his face and seeing how delighted he was oh, that that I was just out oh, of I my didn't. mind. <laughs> yeah. And I think we all want to give gifts to people that they love and that, you know, and this we he just nailed it this one time he really nailed it at a, at a time also that was important um for me to feel seen by him and you know my mom is simpler my mom she lived by the ocean and and when i think about her what i think about is we all get up early in my family all all my siblings and i were all early risers and um my mom used to get up at like 4 30 and so I would come, I would sneak down the stairs early and she would have made just enough coffee for two cups of coffee. Mm -hmm. And she would be waiting to sit on this, on these tiny little stairs. It was, there was furniture we could have sat on, but we sat on the stairs <laughs> and looked out at the ocean and just talked about nothing. And honestly, when I think about my mom and I miss her and I think about memories that were so valuable, it was, the, those are the moments. Those are the, that's how I think of her is like on her tiny little stoop with her little cup of coffee waiting for me or my sisters or whomever to wake up. What a beautiful that. memory to have. I was thinking, I really hope I I give my child yeah. that kind of, that's really, yeah. that's really nice. Because yeah. it's so simple, but mm. so special that. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Megan. Thank you for sharing those memories of John mm. and Mary. And yeah. thank, you for, thank you for sharing just so much of, like we say, your knowledge with us and- Your own experience. Yeah. yeah. And and to just know that you live and breathe what you do and that you do it with passion is wonderful. And like I said earlier, you will help so many people listening to this as well as the people that you help daily through your work. So thank you so, so much for joining oh, us. Thank you. Just like thank you for having me. You guys are, you know, the thing I want to say to both of you is that, you know, you, you did lose your moms really young and that is different than your peers. And I think we're always trying to like, fight against feeling different or but there are some actual things in our lives where you're like that's not the that's not the average and I think traumatic growth is when you can take that thing that others you and turn it into something that benefits others we don't have to do this like I'm not telling people take your trauma and grow daisies mm -hmm. but this podcast is such a beautiful representation of taking your pain and and loneliness and aloneness and singularness and coming you two coming together mm. and and giving us so much wisdom and bringing people on to talk about it. So I'm, I love this podcast and I am really I was so delighted to be asked and I'm really really oh, grateful okay. for the work that you put out in the world. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Before you go, please do let our listeners know where they can find out more about you and the release of your upcoming yeah. memoir as well. Yeah, yeah. So so my memoir, um, The End of the Hour, publishes with Zibby Books in December. The cover art just came out, which is, it's like the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. It oh. makes me cry. Um, so that's coming out and you can go pre-order that book from Amazon if you want. And um, it'll eventually be in Indies. My I do most of my stuff I just because I'm I I do it myself. I do most of it on Instagram. <laughs> Um, so that's the easiest place to find me. And I'm at Megan Reardon Jarvis. Um, all my names are spelled weird. So it might <laughs> we'll be link easiest. to it in the show notes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I have my podcast, Grief is My Side Hustle. All of that is on my website. So if you look up Grief is My Side Hustle, which is easy to remember, you'll find all the spellings of my names and all those things. <laughs> I do have a writing workshop that I run uh, through my website, which is completely free. The prompts come out on Monday. 
Um, so pe there's nothing to join. We don't even send you a newsletter unless you say you want one. It's just little writing exercises that you can come and be a part of. You don't have to share it. It's just there for you. Um, so if people want to come to the website, they can find that there too. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the good work, Megan. Thank you. And thank you. I got you, Joe. This is so lovely. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for, for listening. Um, obviously, you can get in touch with us on our Instagram account as well at the Prank Club Podcast or by emailing hello at uk. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much. <laughs>